Welcome to Naval Medical Center of Portsmouth and Historic Building One, our nation's first and oldest U.S. Naval Hospital. Established in 1830, it has served the medical needs of our men and women in uniform for over 187 years. The first 130 years, it was the primary hospital on this 110-acre compound until 1960 when the tall skyscraper building, known as Building 3, took over the medical duties. However, this hospital still maintained a certain degree of medicine and psychiatry. It served, uh, it also served the OBGYN and that sort of thing. So it has quite a long history and it's gonna be my pleasure to take you through and show you some of the history and some of the artifacts that we have. And um, so if you will join me, and uh, my name is Al Cutchin. I'm the volunteer command historian here at the hospital. And it's gonna be my pleasure to show you around. In 1811, Congress passed legislation uh, creating the hospital fund. Based on the British system, 20 cents a month was deducted from the pay of every sailor, marine, and officer, which would go into this fund to pay for his health care. And it's from that fund that this hospital was built. Now, John Havlin, the noted architect of Philadelphia, and uh, of course, the noted architect of the 1820s and 30s, presented plans for this building to the Navy, and the Navy accepted it. And his choice was to have the building built with the Greek Revival architecture, which is evident by the 10 Doric columns that you see on the porch, and also that roof line up there indicates that it is a, a temple. Now, that's just not by happenstance. Our founding fathers encouraged this new nation to establish the, this type of architecture to allude to the fact that we are a republic, just less like the Greeks and the Romans and so forth. So, if you really think about it, this hospital was built not necessarily by the taxpayers' funds, but by the 20 cents a month that these sailors and Marines and officers put into that hospital fund. April the 2nd, 1827, the construction started on this hospital. It took six years and $200,000 until it was completed. We're now located underneath the uh, main steps in front of the building. This is commonly called the dungeon of the hospital. Now, contrary to popular belief, this is not a dungeon, not for the purpose of uh, um, incarcerating people. It is a place for storage for the hospital. It's an ancillary uh, use. In other words, this is where the uh, oil for lamps were stored, the uh, wood and coal for fireplaces were stored, and even some food products were actually stored here. So this is really the lower chambers not the dungeon, but we here at the hospital refer to it as the dungeon. Um, now John Havlin, in his uh, uh, construction of this building, he designed it so that uh, the, um, we have a cells here for every cell has a purpose. And uh, like I just described, now right here you'll see this uh, tapered cell that held ice. In other words, they would have ice shipped in here and uh, cut into blocks, stored right here, put a layer of sawdust on it and put another layer of ice on it. And each cell had a purpose. What's interesting is that uh, every one of these cells were divided by iron, do iron doors uh, separating each cell. In other words, it, uh, it's designed to keep people out, not, uh, not to keep them in. Uh, people even had tendency back in that day and time to take a little firewood for themselves or whatever. So uh, each cell had a purpose. Now there was one incident during the uh, outbreak of the Civil War when it was used to uh, uh, incarcerate some people. Um, the 3rd Virginia, under the command of uh, Roger Atkinson Pryor, was stationed here at the point at the outbreak of uh, uh, hostilities. And uh, Roger Atkinson Pryor was a uh, avid fire-eating secessionist. He allowed 15 of his men to go downtown to vote whether to stay in the Union or succeed and go with the South. Now, most people in this area were pro-Union. 
The harbor's doing great. The Norfolk and Portsmouth commerce is doing great. The shipyard uh, is 1,500 of uh, Portsmouth's population of 9,000 were actually employed in the shipyard. Everybody's happy. However, uh, one of the men voted to uh, st uh, uh, vote to, to go to the union, and he upset Pryor quite uh, uh, tremendously. So he Pryor had his men locked up here in this dungeon for a couple of days until Governor Letcher in Richmond found out about it and ordered him to let the men go because they were voting their conscience. So uh, that's the only time in recorded history that this was actually used to incarcerate people. Other than that, it is a storage area, ancillary for the, uh, for the building, storage for the building. Now, if you'll focus on these steps right here in the construction of uh, this hospital, John Hallin, the architect, had his men clean and dress over uh, 580,000 brick from old Fort Nelson that existed out here on the point and had them in, uh, uh, incorporated in the uh, steps that you see here. So what you see here is the 1806 brick. Now also the inverted arch that you see was necessary in uh, soil areas like Tidewater, Virginia you had to uh, have this inverted arch to distribute the weight equally uh, along the building. And uh, over top of each one of these uh, uh, buttresses as you see here is uh, one of the 10 Doric columns that you see on, on the porch. Uh, this is the main entrance to the hospital, better known as the quarter deck. Navy tradition has it that the quarter deck is where the captain of his ship issues his orders, receives people, uh, special guests, so forth, and he also performs ceremonies like uh, promotions and uh, things of that nature. So this is what we call the quarter deck. There's been hundreds, possibly thousands, of uh, reenlistments that took place here, uh, uh, elevation in rank, and uh, social activities take place here and so forth, and also um, presentations for, uh, for the good things that the officers and men do. So uh, this is known as the quarter deck, the main entrance. The uh, medical director's office was down this end of the hall, and his associate also was down this end of the hall. We had a waiting room here for the VIPs. We also had a apothecary here that, um, that was in this part of the building. Uh, this hospital here is credited with some firsts. This is the first graduating class of what will become the uh, core school. Uh, these graduates graduated in 1902 right here at this hospital. Uh, now if you'll focus on this gentleman right here, Edward May. Edward May is a native of Australia. He was uh, convinced by a friend that he should come to the United States and apply his trade and skills in training these young men into being medics. Uh, unfortunately, uh, by 1904, uh, Mr. Uh, May came down with typhoid fever. He passed away here at the hospital and he is buried in our cemetery. But he is the first core school instructor. And uh, of course, this is his 1902 class, the first class of what we now know as a core school graduate. In 1908, the Navy had passed legislation accepting females as nurses. The first nurses came to this hospital in 1909, and a very interesting thing happened at that time. The first three nurses that were females to approach the uh, hospital here, they entered into the uh, what it was called the quarter deck, and uh, they were presented to the medical director here at the time. The medical director had requested nurses, but uh, he was under the impression they were going to be male because this was an old male service. Well, he panicked. He says, my gosh, I got females aboard here. I have no accommodations for them, so what am I going to do? Well, the Navy made arrangements in Old Town Portsmouth where these young ladies, these three young ladies could be roomed and boarded at what was known then as the Waverly Apartments. And the, that's where they stayed until such time as they were able to 
uh, uh, provide them with accommodations here at the hospital. Now, another interesting thing is this young lady right here, Lena Higby, we have a street here on the compound named for her. Uh, she was the charge nurse here, the first one here at the hospital. Uh, in, uh, in 1911, she took the oath of office at downtown Portsmouth and uh, where she uh, uh, then proceeded to Washington, D.C., where she became the second superintendent of nurses for the nurse corps. Miss Higby is the first female to have a naval fighting ship named for her. The USS Higby was a destroyer uh, during World War II and Korea and maybe even part of Vietnam. But she also is the first female to be awarded the uh, Navy Cross for her uh, services as uh, second superintendent of nurses. We're now on the third floor, just above the quarter deck. In the early days, when the hospital was first built, if you were part of the staff, you occupied one of these several apartments to my left. Also, we have exhibits that uh, I'd like to explain to you. On the on my left here is the USS Delaware, which was the first ship dry docked in North America, which took place over here at the Gosport Shipyard, now the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. And next we have uh, John Quincy Adams, President of the United States when the hospital uh, cornerstone was first laid. And also we have um, uh, Andrew Jackson, who was in office as President of the United States when we admitted our first patient. And also, in the background, you'll notice there is a uh, uh, likeness of the hospital, uh, the sash lithograph of 1851. Uh, that's how the hospital appeared uh, back at that time when uh, it was first built. Also, we have on this floor, we have some exhibits depicting the uh, Battle of uh, Hampton Roads, which took place on March the 8th, 1862 at which time the newly built uh, ironclad CSS Virginia sailed out of the shipyard at Norfolk, passed by Hospital Point here, and entered into the Hampton Roads area where the ironclad rammed the Cumberland and, uh, and hot uh, fired the Congress, sinking both of the ships. Uh, Franklin Buchanan, who was the captain of uh, the Virginia at that time, uh, became wounded during that day's activity. So uh, later on that evening, he was brought here as a patient and he spent three months here. Captain Buchanan was a uh, uh, well-noted uh, officer of the United States Navy at, uh, before the Civil War. He went to sea at the age of 15 and uh, of course, uh, when the hostilities broke out between the North and the South, uh, he was, uh, he, uh, thought that Maryland was his native state was going to succeed, which they didn't. And he went on to the South and uh, offered his uh, services, which they accepted. And the interesting thing about uh, uh, Captain Buchanan, it was in this hospital that he received word that he had uh, been uh, nominated for, to receive the rank of Admiral. Also, he is the first instructor of what we now know as the Naval Academy in Annapolis. So uh, he was perhaps our most popular or famous uh, patient during that period. This is the North Wing and the most historic wing we have here at the hospital. Uh, originally, this was an outdoor porch that we're standing on. It was closed in later on, probably in the, around the 1940s, I think. But in order to serve patients inside the wall here, uh, the medical staff came out onto the porch and they'd enter one of the doors here to treat their patients. Uh, each ward, uh, which there was two of them, each ward would accommodate 102 patients for a total of 204 patients. And um, uh, this being the most uh, historic, mainly because Surgeon Williamson, who was uh, over at the Naval Shipyard at the time, or Gosport Shipyard, I should say, he was ordered in uh, 1830 to bring the first patients over here. This wing here was uh, had made the most progress in completion, so those patients were brought here to this wing. And um, uh, 
Later on, in 1855, the uh, merchant ship Franklin, Ben Franklin, pulled in the harbor here under the pretense of having some repairs done. And uh, at the time, he had uh, yellow fever aboard. And the harbor medical director told him that he would allow his ship to go into Page and Allen Shipyard, which is next to the Gospel Shipyard, to have these repairs done, provided that he don't uh, pump the bilges or open up the hull. Well, guess what? He pumped the bilges and he opened up the hull. Mosquitoes escaped. Of course, back then they didn't know it was a mosquito that was carrying this yellow fever. But as a uh, consequence, uh, at least 15% of the population of Portsmouth fell victim to this yellow fever. And um, so much so that the city fathers of Portsmouth went to Washington, D.C. and asked permission that this hospital open its doors to the local population so that they can take advantage of the skills of the uh, uh, medical staff here uh, and hopefully that they would recover. And as a consequence, over 600 patients from the city of Portsmouth were actually um, um, brought back to health here. Um, and also, at that time, there were several orphans walking the streets of Portsmouth. Their parents fell victim to yellow fever. Uh, they were brought here to this hospital and they were housed in this wing until uh, accommodations could be made for them down on Glasgow Street, down to what is now Old Town Portsmouth. Uh, as we move on, um, the medical director here at the time, uh, Lewis Minor, his 10-year-old son, actually fell victim to the yellow fever. And he is buried over here in our cemetery. So the yellow fever really took quite a, uh, quite uh, heavy on the population here. Um, and later on, uh, we move up to the Spanish-American War, and um, uh, Admiral Severa's Spanish fleet was um, destroyed off the coast of Santiago, Cuba. And as uh, happened, that 48 of the Spanish crew were brought to this hospital and housed in this wing here. Now the medical director at that time gave strict orders that these Spanish sailors were not to be molested in any way, not to be bothered. They are recuperating from their burns that they received in the battle. And uh, so uh, people were not allowed to, to visit these sailors or in any way bother them. And uh, in other words, they had the attitude that these Spanish sailors were not enemy. They were fellow seamen that were in distress. And they were treated with such kindness that uh, when they did, after the, uh, after the uh, Spanish-American War, report back to Spain, uh, letters were written praising this hospital and also uh, a thank you for the humane treatment that these sailors received. Of course, we move on up to World War I and World War II. These wings were very active and also Korea and so forth. But um, uh, these, uh, these uh, walls are granite that, uh, that uh, are original. And uh, of course, the porch area here has been closed in. Uh, so, uh, and it's now part of the office, uh, used as uh, offices for the uh, uh, Navy Medical Center, Portsmouth operation. You may recall the uh, uh, the class of uh, what would become the corpsmen uh, that were here in 1902. They were housed here in this wing and they also studied here and likely took their meals here too. So this is the most historic wing we have. At the outbreak of the Civil War, uh, the 3rd Virginia Regiment was stationed here at the hospital and at that time there was a wall behind the hospital that was 14 feet high, 3 feet thick. It was called the garden wall and Roger Pryor, Colonel Pryor at the time in charge of the 3rd Virginia, uh, had his men drill and march and this sort of thing at the garden wall and he was real strict about letting these men uh, leave the compound here. Now these men were local men. They were part of a rifle company from Portsmouth, and uh, of course, they uh, they wanted to go downtown to see their wives, their sweethearts, and uh, family, and so forth. But Colonel Pryor was uh, real strict. He he would uh, frown on that. 
So it, the person, when a key time would appear, these men would help each other scale that wall and uh, so they could go downtown and visit with their family and so forth. And uh, one evening there was three ladies from Portsmouth walking through what was called ho Hospital Woods in the back of the building here. And they noticed that uh, some of uh, Richardson, who, uh, William Richardson's men, William Richardson was uh, the um, officer in charge of this uh, group of men. Anyway, uh, they noticed that Richardson's men were scaling the wall like a bunch of wildcats. And the name Richardson's Wildcats followed that regiment throughout the Civil War. We're now underneath the Copper Dome on top of the building. Uh, this is where the OR, or operating room, was relocated in 1909. And the operations up here were conducted on the skylight, which is above me. And also the windows that you see behind me gave light for operations. Uh, at that time, ether and chemicals like that were uh, used, but it, not electricity because uh, for fear of explosions. Um, the, this was state-of-the-art, and uh, obviously by the tiles that, uh, on the wall here were easy to clean. And at the end of the day, it was a corner's job to open these windows behind me so he could air the place out. And um, each room had a purpose. Uh, there's several rooms up here. One room was for the storage of uh, instruments after they had been properly sterilized and wrapped and stored. And then there's another room where the gauze and bandages were received in bolts where a corpsman would set and, and uh, cut these uh, bandages and gauze into the proper measurement and then have them stored in a room. And then there's another room that was used originally for the etherizing room, as they called it. But uh, soon after that, it was converted into the x-ray room. And then there's another room where the young ladies who assisted in operations uh, had, a, uh, had lockers and uh, that's where they dressed and pre prepared themselves for help with operations here. Uh, also, across the hall from that, the surgeons had their uh, uh, facility where they uh, could dress and uh, take showers and that sort of thing. But this right here is the main operating uh, room here. Then also, to my left, there was a room where the, uh, the uh, hospital staff made their own IV solutions. Building 1 was placed on the national list of historic places in 1972. Again, I want to thank you for taking this tour with me and allowing me to take you around this most historic building. Thank you. In 1999, all patient care was transferred from Building 1 in the high-rise building to the newly constructed Charette Center. The Charette Healthcare Center was named after Master Chief Hospital Corpsman William Charette, who received the Congressional Medal of Honor for service during the Korean War, as well as becoming one of the first hospital corpsmen to ever serve on nuclear submarines. After extensive renovation of both buildings, Building 1 became the Administration and Command Center of Navy Medical Center Portsmouth, and the High Rise became Administrative Headquarters for Navy Medicine East. Naval Medical Center Portsmouth, known as the first and finest, has a staff of about 6,500 personnel, which include military, civilian, and contractors. They provide quality medical care for approximately 425,000 active duty retired and dependent members, and the center also maintains 10 area branch clinics. Throughout its history, Naval Medical Center Portsmouth and the City of Portsmouth have enjoyed a close relationship, and I hope you have enjoyed the early history tour of Building One our nation's first and oldest U.S. Naval Hospital. Naval Medical Center, Portsmouth.